Blessing it is to hear. Ricky, good to have you back. Marty, good job this morning. Flip, you did okay. <laughs> JB, KW, Missy, Mrs. C, Britt, Mrs. C with the kids this morning. What a beautiful job. Praise the Lord for it. We're here to magnify the Lord in worship and in the Word. And to do that this morning, we're going to look in Isaiah 53. Someone said to me this past week, said, you've been doing all these finding Jesus in Isaiah wouldn't you really find him everywhere? I said, oh, you caught on. Find somebody finally caught on. Yes, Jesus is everywhere. The difference, the difference today, though, however, is not only are we finding Jesus in Isaiah, but uh, we're finding you in Isaiah as well. You and me are going to be found here in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 53. Some say it's the greatest chapter in the Bible. Now, I've, I've chosen Isaiah 53 to share with you the life of Jesus Christ, and I, I think it is the most complete picture. In fact, it's the most defined description of the cross in the entire Bible. More is said in Isaiah 53 about the physical happening at the cross than in all four of the Gospels. So when we look at that, uh, there's a beautiful outline. And uh, years ago, Adrian Rogers was, said, I want to take you to Isaiah 53. And he, and he gave us this outline. Jesus, the virgin birth, verse 1 and 2. Jesus, his virtuous life, verse 2 and 3. Jesus, his vic, uh, vicarious death, verse 4 through 11. Jesus, his victorious resurrection, verse 9 and 10. Jesus, his visible return, verse 11 and 12. And I was writing my hands off just trying to get all that outline. And he was saying, every one of you preachers is going to be using that outline the next two weeks. But I want you to know something. It's not mine. He said, old-time preachers, he said, I have seen this outline as far back as 100 years. All the old-time preachers had this outline. I had never seen it or heard it, but it is a tremendous uh, compounding of what the Word is. So let's look at it in Isaiah 53. Would you stand in honor of God's Word this morning if you have a copy of the Word of God? If not, look on. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. And he has no form or comeliness. And when he, we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised. And we did not esteem him. Surely he hath borne our grief and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living." For the transgression of my people he was stricken, and they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, for he 
shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion of the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressions, and he bore the sin of many, and he has made intercession for the transgressors. Did you see how this room changed about midway through when you started tuning in to the cross and to what Jesus Christ has done? Be seated. Let's begin finding Jesus in Isaiah, finding you in Isaiah, finding me in Isaiah. Martin Luther wrote that this verse, this chapter, should have been on golden parchment written with letters of diamonds. I think there's no other chapter in all the Word of God like Isaiah 53. And the first thing we're going to look at is Jesus, his virgin birth, verse 1 and 2. Jesus, his virgin birth. People will ask, what's What's the virgin birth? Why? Why does it have to be a virgin birth? Why did this all have to happen this way? You remember from the book of Romans, this, the, the sons of Adam, in the sons of Adam, all die. Had he come through as a son of Adam, he would have, had, he would have been dead. But the virgin birth, without the virgin birth, you say, well, why did it have to be the virgin birth? You got to remember he is writing this 700 years before Mary rocks that baby in a Bethlehem major. 700 years. And I'm, I'm reminded, and so many people are upset and, and, and excited both about the eclipse. I was in Walmart here in town yesterday, and people are just all about the eclipse. And I get that. I, it is a big deal. You, you, won't, you won't see it again. However, events do not create prophecy. No, no event creates prophecy. Prophecy had to come before the even thought of an event came. That's why when Isaiah wrote this 700 years before Jesus was even born, he's talking about the virgin birth that no one else <clears throat> was talking about. Now, why the virgin birth? Because if there was no virgin birth, there would be no deity. If there was no deity, there would be no sinlessness. If there was no sinlessness, there would be no blood atonement. If there was no blood atonement, there would be no new birth. If there was no new birth, there would be no hope of heaven. That's why the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant out of a dry ground. <clears throat> so that's the virgin birth of Jesus Christ coming as the tender plant in the desert. Many people, including scholars of the Bible, including many pastors, including many churches and denominations, now say the virgin birth is not a requirement for anyone to believe. Nothing is a requirement for anyone to believe. But if you say, I am not sure that I can believe the virgin birth of Christ, I can promise you this, then you're not going to see the heaven that Jesus talks about because if you stumble over the very first fact that he was virgin born, you're going to stumble over the fact that he is king of kings and lord of lords and that he's coming back riding the white horse that Brit sang about a moment ago. So if you fall here in faith, you will not be able to, to stand and say, well, all right, I, I'm not really sure how the virgin birth came about. don't really believe that, but I do believe in the blood atonement. I don't think you can do that. I think you have to accept by faith exactly what this word says. And that's why many of the, the, the Jewish people get upset with us as believers, and I've even said it wrongly. I was, I was put right in my place about I used to say that the, the Jewish rabbis would not allow Isaiah 53 to be read in synagogue. That's not really true. They don't read it. It during any worship service because it's not part of the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. And they have only chosen portions of different prophecies that they read in the Rapha. The Rapha is any other time that they meet and they just start telling. There are a few of the, of the uh, Isaiah passages that they read in Jeremiah, but they don't read Isaiah 53. That's not their problem. The problem is they don't believe that's talking about Jesus. That's the problem. They don't have a problem with Isaiah 53 being true. 
They just say it's not Jesus. I'm telling you, if it's not Jesus, I have nothing to hang my hat on. I have no anchor for my soul. If this is not the most descript uh, personage of Jesus Christ in all the Bible, I don't know what is. Yes, it is speaking of Jesus and his virgin birth. Not only the virgin birth, though, but look in verse 2 and 3. It's Jesus, his virtuous life. He shall grow up. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. He's despised and rejected, a man of sorrows. So it has this, this, this look. What is a virtuous life? It simply is not stating that Jesus was difficult to look at, that he was ugly. Now, it is speaking of the cross because in Isaiah 52, verse 14, so his visage was marred more than any man. Yes, that is the cross, but his virtuous life was not that. It's just that he didn't stand out physically. You know, all the European painters, and that's what we have the pictures of in the Bible, all the European painters had him like he was just stepping out of the beauty shop. You know, long, curly, beautiful hair. Or if they don't have that picture, they have this this light that's shining behind his head, looked like a big old dinner plate uh, standing behind his head. They have that, that... so, so that they want you to see and say, and he was like three inches taller than everyone else. This says that his uh, particularly virtuous life had nothing to do with the way he looked. Look where he came from. Bethlehem was the least of all villages and hamlets. Came from the least, the smallest. Look at his family life. His daddy was a carpenter. He grew up regular. You would think, okay, God is coming down in the flesh. He's going to come in a jewel chariot. He's going to come with thousands of thousands of thousands of angels. Revelation 20 talks about the angels, 10,000 times 10,000 angels. That's 100 million angels. He could have come with 100 million angels. But what does he do? He he comes to a little smelly barn in Bethlehem. There's nothing about his uh, life being virtuous in how he looked. And that, in fact, it says there was no beauty that we should desire him and despise. He wasn't particularly uh, always known. You say, I, I'm not sure I understand that. Well, had he been the other way, why did Judas have to point him out? Do you ever wonder that? They're standing there in the garden. Why did Judas uh, I look over there? It's that one. It's that one. Well, it was dark in the garden. See, this, this life being virtuous He's a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him, despised, and we did not esteem that despising. The best thing we could do was not make eye contact with Jesus then. The whole cross, everything about it, the virtuous life that he lived was not just about the cross. It was about everywhere that he went. He just did his thing. Being virtuous. What does it mean, and how did he do it? Being virtuous was not about how he looked, how he sounded, how his voice uh, personified over the waters, how he did all that. It's just that he was himself. One of the most difficult things for us to do as believers is, is to be who God created us to be. Just be who you're supposed to be. Stop trying to be like everyone else. Nine-tenths of all the problems with kids in schools would be eliminated if we could just teach them that they are uniquely created by God. No one else is going to be like them. Stop competing on every level about everything, about who's wearing what, and just be who you're supposed to be in Jesus Christ. That's what virtue is, to be who you're supposed to be in Jesus Christ. But not only was there a virtuous life found there, but we see that uh, his vicarious death, verse 4, And this has the most uh, passages, verse 4. Surely he has borne our grief, carried our sorrows. We esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, afflicted, wounded for our transgression, bruised for iniquity, chastisement of our peace was upon him, by his stripes we're healed. Now, we're we're going to look at the the, uh, vicarious death. The word vicarious, if you look it up, you know what it means? In place of. His vicarious death means in place of. We'll use the word, as we do in modern English, of substitute. When I used to sit on the bench playing basketball uh, as a sophomore and a junior, we, I sat on the bench, and I would sub in when the coach got mad at one of the starting five, and I would sub in, and I had to go to the scorer's table and said, I'm going in for 15, and, and, and then I would play. 
And about 45 seconds after he got through chewing 15 out, he stopped it again. I go back out. He subs in for me. A sub means I'm going to stand in his place. Doesn't mean I'm going to do what he did. I'm just going to sub in for him. That's what vicarious means. And now we find ourselves here because uh, in verse 4, he has borne your grief. He has smitten by your grief. He was esteemed, smitten. He was afflicted. He was wounded for our transgression. Everything about us is found here in the light of who we are as a sinner. His vicarious death became a substitute so that we might have life. Our life comes from the Father. Our, our eternal life is not one by which we have earned because of our virtuous life, but because of his vicarious death. If you stop and think about it, when someone subs in for you, taking your place, and, and tells you, I've got this for you, I'm going to do this for you, that's the most humbling thing that I see about Easter. And I, I got a thing, an email all the time, but email uh, this week said, buy this package. It's seventy nine ninety nine. How to make your Easter service a wow factor. <laughs> Only cost 80 bucks to figure out how to get Easter to wow. I'd like to know what they would do that's greater than the cross experience and three days in the tomb. I'd like to know how you wow factor that anymore. I'd like to know how any fact, any factor, the benefactor of that cross experience was us and how that could be any greater of a wow factor. And I don't know what that 80 bucks will buy you, and I'm kind of tempted. I'd like to know, but I'm sure it's just a curriculum that you lose and use and, and, and hold up. And I even thought the first time that I saw the empty tomb in, in Jerusalem over the bus, there's a great big bus station with 50, 100 buses down there, diesel smoke rolling up, and I'm looking at the tomb. I thought that would have some sort of a wow factor experience. But it really didn't. I looked in there, it's empty. There was a pastor who was touring Russia 30, 40 years ago, and he went to the tomb of Lenin and uh, these soldiers, and they make a big deal of it, how they look and all and so the pastor asked this guard, what, what are you doing? He said, we're guarding our hero's tomb. And the pastor said, thank God nobody's got to guard my hero's tomb. He ain't there. Amen. Now, what, what wow factor are you going to put to that? When a believer understands that the vicarious death of Jesus Christ is the benefactor for us in that he subbed in for us. Boy, that should keep us in a way that were humble, shouldn't it? The, vi the vicarious death of Christ in place of, verse 9 it says, and the Lord laid on him, the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. And that's where you're found, I'm found, every one of us is found. He has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Like Abraham in Genesis 22, he, he laid the, the wood on his son Isaac's back. And he went up the cross. We've got a picture of Jesus that's going to do it um, 800 years later, but, or 1,000 years later. But there's that picture. He laid on him the iniquity of us all. You know, when someone takes something from you that was going to cause you great pain and say, I'll take care of it, I'll do this. Anytime a loved one goes through, um, your, your husband or wife goes through this pain or suffering, what do you always say? I wish I could take this for you. I wish I, I, I would take it in a heartbeat if I could do this for you. That's because we love them. And he laid on, us, on him the iniquity of us all. Now it makes me wonder though in this vicarious death, it says also in verse 9, he was wounded. The word wounded means pierced. Pierced. I hate the thought of that. I've never been in any kind of a knife fight in my life, but in in army and military training, you always had to, you had to train with all sorts of knives and things. But the, the very, the fact of being stuck with a sword or a, a, a spear, it's just quenching uh, to the spirit. The word wounded means that he was pierced for us. That's the vicarious death. And so we look at this and I think about the Garden of Gethsemane and all this month we'll be talking about it because this is the month that we... We, we try to lead up to the resurrection of all that happened to him. But the Gethsemane, the more I think about it, the more I am sad about what Gethsemane actually was. And he said, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. And so you, you wonder about the cup. 
What's in that cup? What's in this cup? And why? See, it wasn't the physical death that he was afraid of. He was not saying, stop the proceedings so that I won't go to the cross. He wasn't saying that. He was saying, let this cup pass from me. What's in that cup? My sin, my transgressions, your sin, your sin, your, 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 your. The cup gets larger and larger and larger. And, and the fact, the point is, every sin that's ever been committed and every sin that will be committed was in that cup. He said, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. Why? The weight of this cup is so large, it's so huge, that what's in it is unbearable. What's in it is unbearable. This past week in the state of Illinois, a judge released a man who had raped a little bitty girl. Within three days, the, and I'm so glad when I see some righteousness come up, the state legislature had met and the state senate had met and it took him three days. They came and got the judge out, kicked him out of his thing, took his robe off of him, kicked him out and said, you are not worthy of a robe. Now, amen. Every once in a while, he did it right. You know why he let him go? Because he was a, he was a sodomite himself. He actually did not believe that this was a sin. That's, the, that's in the cup, folks. That's in this cup. The acts that we are seeing betrayed now upon television, that's, I have given up attempting to reform both Washington and Hollywood. We're never going to do it. Only Jesus is going to win this war. And that's why you talk about the virtuous life and what we dress. Why do, those, why do the Hollywood folks have to dress the way that they dress? Because it causes attention to who they are. They always want to be known for who they are. They want to be seen for who they are. Yet Jesus walked around just regular clothes. Nobody could pick him out in the crowds of thousands because he looked like everyone else. But the vicarious death means he took upon him this cup, this iniquity. Then in verse 9 and 10, the, the uh, victorious resurrection of Jesus Christ. And when you look at this, uh, verse 10, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief when you make his soul an offering for sin. And this is the point. This is the Eli Lila Masabatanai. My God, why have you forsaken me? Because the cup is there. The cup is being poured out. And when it says it, it pleased God to bruise him, it does, doesn't mean that he enjoyed the process. It means that it was completed. He was accepting the process. Verse 11, he shall see the labor of his soul. And look at this word, be satisfied. God was satisfied in what Jesus Christ did on the cross. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many. He is justifying them through the end act of the resurrection. For he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion of the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong. What do you do when you win a victory? What, what happens when you won the victory? You divide the spoils. When Jesus Christ left that tomb and he rose from the dead, went to the hand of the Father, he's no longer dead, he's alive, and he's dividing the spoils. Someday he's going to come back and rule and reign. And that leads us to the last thing that we'll say in verse 11 and 12, his visible return. There is coming, in, in verse 11, he shall see the labor, he's satisfied. Therefore, I will divide him a portion of the great, divide them with the strong, because he poured out his soul into death, he was numbered for the transgression. He bore the sins of many. And because of that, in his return, he's going to divide the spoils up. I don't know if that means, Wayne Belt, that you and I are going to rule over Heber Springs. I think we'd do a good job when he comes back. Um, but he's going to divide the spoils. And that's the risen Lord, the visible return of Jesus Christ. There's going to come a point, Revelation 20 and Revelation 21, and First Thessalonians 4, the trump of God will sound. Uh, the will sound, we which are dead in Christ. At that sound, then we which are alive and remain. So there's going to be this point by which the second coming of Jesus Christ is going to be visible. Everything is visible. You don't believe that? Get on your phone for five minutes. Everything in the world is visible. I'm afraid to go in a bathroom anymore because, you know, in a public bathroom, anywhere and everywhere you look, there's somebody watching, there's somebody recording, there's somebody uh, with this going on. Everything is visible. You can watch a ping pong match in Hong Kong at 3 o'clock in the morning if you want to because of all the channels. We don't watch TV anymore. We stream. And it's wild. 
We're paying money every month for different streaming services. There are hundreds of channel capabilities. I'm telling you, this is going to be a visible return. You're going to see it. In fact, every eye shall see and every ear will hear this visible return. So there is a vicarious death in which he substituted himself for you. And this is now running over 2,000 years in which that substitution was made. There's about 6,000 years of known human history. And when is he coming back? I don't know. What do you think that this, do you, do, do you think that the thing coming up on the 8th, the eclipse, do you think that has anything to do with it? I have no idea. I have absolutely no idea. The only thing I do know is that it will be visible. And hey, if it is on April the 8th, that would be a date that we all already know. I don't think it's going to qualify because it says that no man knows. Even the sun doesn't know the time. So I don't think that qualifies. But what I'm saying is get your eyes off what's the world, what the world is positioning. Get your eyes off of the world, what it's saying. Get them on Jesus Christ because his visible return will be a visible one. His death is vicarious for you. His life was virtuous in that you don't have to be a big shot. You can just be a regular guy or gal. And serving Jesus being you want to be, his birth was from the virgin. Wow. Isaiah 53 then is the most beautiful picture of who Jesus Christ actually is. Right here stuck in the middle of the Bible, the most descript picture. A person of Jesus Christ is given to us. He was wounded for our transgressions. There's a verse I haven't mentioned, by stripes we're healed. I know that we love to use that. I quote it all the time, by stripes we're healed. Many people have taken that off to mean one thing, only physical healing, but that's not what he's talking about. In its context, the stripe is being healed is for the cup of iniquity that was full, and the only way that could be healed was for the cup to be drunk, to be dumped out and Jesus Christ become our vicarious death. We've all seen death. We've all experienced people that we've loved to die. And there's always a moment by which it's just really difficult. My wife and I were talking about grieving and people grieving just yesterday. And it's a process you have to go through. It's just something you have to go through. And if you refuse it, if you reject it, then you don't understand. And, and we're still looking at this grieving, the experience of body stripes were healed. Yes, but what all happened in this, this thing with Jesus? We want to make so much of what happened to him that we forget the good part that is by his stripes. We are healed. The end result of this is we can have a relationship with Jesus Christ because of him vicariously giving his life for us, substituting. You wives, have you ever sat at at a table at a restaurant and the men get to fighting over the bill? And you all roll your eyes. Yeah. Well, no. Why do we do that? Well, there's several reasons. One, we are prideful. And I want to pay the bill. No, I'm going to pay the bill. Now, I usually yield pretty quick. If you're that intent, you know what I'm saying? Uh, there's a lot of things I'm going to fight over, but if that day, I'm not going to fight with you about that. Pride factor. Fact of the matter is, we cannot pay that bill. There's not a soul in this room rich enough, famous enough, can have enough resources to say, I will cover your sin vicariously. I will take care of that sin debt for you. Can't do it. Only Jesus came. He came through a virgin birth. He lived a a life that was full of virtue, and he had a vicarious death that brought us into the victorious resurrection and waiting on that visible return of Jesus Christ. Now, what, what do you have and who do you owe The book of Romans says, owe no man anything but love, but we have a debt that we could not pay. He paid a debt that he did not owe. Thank God for that great exchange. That's the greatest exchange you'll ever make in your life. If you're here this morning without that hope of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the truth of that and the soon return of him coming back to us, if you're without that peace and hope of Jesus Christ is my Lord, then this morning, right where you're sitting, you can confess Jesus Christ as your Lord. If you're here this morning and you're hurting physically, you're hurting spiritually, emotionally, or or, or you've been harmed, um, you've been abused, you've been hurt, I am telling you the only way to have peace from that chastisement is to turn it over to Jesus Christ and say those words, Jesus, 
I give this to you. And I know that seems like you just don't understand. What I've done is too great. No, you don't know how big that cup was. You just don't know how big that cup was of, of what he could take. So I say to you this morning, hundreds of us here that need to just thank God that he gave us grace for the last seven days. Just he gave us grace. He said, I, I didn't win every battle and I, and I lost money here and I did this wrong. I, I know it, but he has given you enough grace to be sufficient for your every need this week. There's not a believer that could stand up this week and say, oh, I, I, I beg to differ, Pastor. His grace was not sufficient for me. Because he's already said, I'll, I'll, I will meet your need according to my riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You, you may have blown it a time or two, but I am telling you, his grace is sufficient. This may be the morning that you just come to say, God, I thank you that your grace was sufficient last week, but I'm telling you this week, I'm in it. I'm up to my knees. I was telling Jeff Lee a moment ago, and um, our son and his family, they went without water for around 19 days. Their line was busted. No one could get to it. And we finally had to call one of those trenchless water detectors. So that anytime they used the water, they'd have to go uh, 1,800 feet down to a meter, take the little meter stick, turn it on, run and get a shower, pull up the water, run back. And, and I kept saying to him, doesn't this give you a great appreciation for faucets and, and taps and showers? And they had to do this for 19 days. When we finally got, finally got there, had to dig a hole. It was muddy. It was leaking 54 gallons an hour. It's down in that mud. We find the water line and, uh, and uh, attempt to fix this line. And I thank God that you know, even though he could turn the water on, turn the water off, turn the water on. Don't you just thank God when it's all fixed and you can run, take a hot shower. You can use water. You can waste water. We just take it all for granted. Everything we have. We just take it as, I deserve this. What? And, and I'm always surprised when people are surprised about life. I was, I, I was in a, a public restroom on Friday. I walked in there and a the man's standing there with his hands out and they're both wet. And he just, it was just like he was in total disbelief. That th there were no paper towels. And he's just standing there. And I'm thinking, hey, partner, you can stand there all you want. Hey, it ain't. You might as well get your britches out and wipe them down. Because he's just standing there. I'm surprised that you're surprised. I'm surprised that you don't know that Satan is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour this week. That's what he's after. He's after you. You're after your family. Thank God. For the life that Jesus Christ lived. So this may be a day by which you say, you know what? I just want to thank God this week. Or I, I just need to come to him because I need physical healing, emotional healing. I've been abused. I've been hit. I've been su subjugated by someone else or something else. It's time to come out from under that. Let's stand together. What a beautiful day for you to say, this, you know what? I'm just going to go confess this to the Lord. Whatever it is, no one else needs to know. And, and, and let me say, before we come to this moment, American churches have made it difficult for us to find a way to confess anything. Modern pastors are saying, we don't want an invitation time. And, and I'm not fighting over that. I'm just simply saying, why, why do you shut off the one opportunity people have to actually stop and pray? Stop and confess. There is just absolutely nothing more beautiful than to see a soul surrender for any reason. To see the soul surrender. So don't feel as though that there's some sort of pressure. You listen to the Holy Spirit as you pray and as you seek the Lord in this moment of, of coming to a point uh, of prayer. As you bow your head, some of you are praying specifically for your family. Like Steve, y'all praying for Chloe, precious little baby, uh, jaundiced and going to have to have a blood transfusion. And, and you're seeing uh, all these, these things. <laughs>